With every Sony state of play, the same rumor gets propped up. Blood One PC port is coming soon, guys, get ready. Ah! Something we keep hearing about, but with no confirmation from Sony themselves for a few years now. So, instead of waiting on the port any longer, Round 8 Studios and NeoWiz decide to take matters into their own hands and made their own Souls spin-off, Lies of P. Being a Souls-like and not a Soulsborne game, I think it's important to establish where this IP stacks against its counterparts and others in the same subgenre. What does this game do differently? Does it merit a spot amongst the greats of this genre? Does it have enough oomph to stand on its own legs? I'd argue yes. While taking some inspiration from its spiritual predecessors, it's all in good faith and seems to just be a staple in this subgenre going forward. While it does draw heavy inspiration from its peers, and yes, if you cherry pick, you could argue that some of these mechanics are in existing titles, Lies of P shakes up how you use them and has a style that I would argue is a bit more similar to Armored Core. You're not crafting this one build fits all. You can certainly do that, but you are also given plenty of opportunities to go off the rails and experiment, using everything the game gives you to gain the edge upon your puppet foes. After all, games inspire one another all the time. Look at Skyrim, turning most RPGs from a more linear experience to a now open world format that people are so fond of. Breath of the Wild then iterates on this idea and makes the world something the player can interact with on a more intimate level. Being able to move things around, manipulate physics, and reach almost any destination. Then further iterated upon in Tears of the Kingdom, to truly embrace the sandbox elements the first game had to offer. Aside from this, there is stealing and then making your own product out of the original ideas the first game had to offer. This formula shows that by emulating your peers, but putting your own spin on it is a formula that can lead to success. But does this hold true for Liza P? Why doesn't Pinocchio's nose get bigger when he lies? And why does the cat hate me? Who knows? All good questions and more will answer in this video. While drawing inspiration from the Soulsborne series, I'd argue that Liza P does a good job of standing on its own two feet and not being an inferior or a downgrade of those games. The game takes mechanics that are present in existing titles that you may know and love, but does so in its own way. With that, let's talk about the gameplay of Liza P. Now, there are a lot of systems going on here compared to your traditional Souls-like. Looking at it all at once may be confusing, but the game introduces it to you in chunks so as to not overwhelm the player, which is a good thing. You play as P, or Pinocchio, and can customize him as you would any character in a Souls game. I'm going to avoid the comparisons to Dark Souls as I feel it's redundant and you'll gather this from the gameplay, but also what I discuss. If there's a relevant reason to bring it up later in the video though, I will. You carry a weapon in your right hand, and your left hand is occupied by what is known as a legion arm. There is the standard health, stamina, and mana system, as in most RPGs, but in Liza P, to use the mana system, or fable arts as it's called in this game, must be done by either popping pills, or attacking enemies repeatedly until you meet the required amount of bars to trigger a fable art. These serve as special moves tied to the blade and handle of a weapon, and there are many different fable arts that do different things. Some serve as extra attacks, others are evades, they can apply special affixes to your weapon, or even serve as utility options for different scenarios, such as a perfect guard allowing you to block an attack without having to time it. Aside from the offensive techniques and utility of fable skills, you are also equipped with a dodge that will work on everything except grabs and super attacks. And also the perfect guard that anybody can use, which is just timing your block to be right before an attack would hit you, thus keeping your health bar safe and only losing a bit of stamina. The other benefit to this is slowly whittling down the enemy to a staggerable state where if you hit them with a charged heavy or another hard hitting move, they shall be knocked still for a few seconds, allowing you to punish them with a few hits and a fatal attack. A special attack that can only trigger once the enemy is knocked down and rewards you with a ton of damage dealt to them. On the subject of weapons and fable arts, instead of just offering you the 41 weapons available as is now, you can mix and match 30 of them to create a ton of different variations in your weapons. Take the rapier and the greatsword as an example. Two weapons you can get towards the start of your adventure. Maybe you want to pack more punch in your blade instead of the rapier. You can remove the blade of the greatsword from its hilt and strap it onto the rapier's hilt. Now you have a dex scaling greatsword. 
The kicker is that, aside from having a higher damage, you can actually alter the moveset of any weapon through the different hilt options. Every hilt has a different style of fighting attached to it. Some may be a bit similar, but for the most part it offers a unique fighting style, and combining it with different blades will also change the speed of your weapon swings. As an example, let's say you wanted to use the sweeping moveset of the greatsword or the booster blade, but the default swing is too slow for you. Well, you can just use the hilt of that weapon and combine it with the needle-like edge of the rapier, granting you a much faster swing and recovery time while incorporating the moveset you want. This allows you to not feel as if you're locked into specific playstyles when you invest into your character. Playing a technique build won't lock you out of motivity-based blades, and vice versa, allowing the player true freedom over how you want your Pinocchio to combat foes. Aside from weapon enhancements through changing the hilts and blades, you can also straight up alter a weapon scaling if you really like everything about it as is. Or if it's a boss weapon as these are not customizable and are then able to use it with your current build without feeling the need to change up your stats. On top of all this, there is also the ability to respec the different skill trees you get access to later on. The developers have given the player tons of freedom that isn't always present in the original Dark Souls games, aside from the use of very specific hard to get items. You are encouraged to experiment and solve the different fights any way you so choose in this title, as the cost for this isn't very expensive, allowing for creative freedom and more decisions on the player's part, which is always a good thing. On top of weapon flexibility, there is also the Legion Arm system. This starts off a bit slow as your options are limited, but as you progress you gain access to 8 different arms available for you to craft and mess around with. These have associated scalings with each weapon type that will have you leaning towards using something that lines up with your build, but some of the options have a utility aside from their respective scalings, such as the Aegis being a shield for anybody and the Puppet String allowing you to pull mobs towards you or pull yourself towards the mobs. This gives you an extra edge against some of the challenging foes this game has to throw at you, and there are a lot. Legion Arms give you different things you can use to alleviate some shortcomings of your build. The boss is too far from you? Use the puppet string to pull yourself closer to enemies. Want to have a bit of range while fighting an opponent? Well, the game lets you turn into Barret from FF7 and go nuts. Or maybe you need a bit of AoE, well there's the flamethrower that can tackle a lot of mobs at once. You can even further specialize in fields such as either legion arms or your weapons and attacks through the P-Organ system. This system works as that of a skill tree you'd find in other RPGs. As you make your way through the game, you'll open chests and fight bosses that drop these rare materials and can use them to fine tune your build. Maybe you want to do more damage with fable arts and have more of that resource, it's there. Need some extra healing as you feel like you're running out? Done and dusted. Not only does it unlock these big key passives, but to unlock them, you'll be picking from some of the more minor choices that add up and further improve your build. You can make it so your last pull cell will recharge automatically after it's fully empty, Get more slots for throwables or consumables? Can't decide on what amulets to use? Well, you can get extra slots there as well. The game gives you a lot of leeway to turn the tide of battle in your favor and allow you to come up with some really fun, unique builds. For my run, I decided to focus on the dexterity builds of this game, or a technique build as the game calls it. Initially, I was a fan of this as I could get greedy with the rapier and go for many hits compared to my counterpart's starting options, and this allowed me to mess up a bit more when it comes to exploring and getting overwhelmed by mobs or in a boss fight, as I could squeeze out windows where there are none on other weapons. Thinking I'd be locked into mostly fast weapons, that was quickly changed as upon reaching the region where the demo ends, I was given a dexterity scaling greatsword, and this filled me with a sense of gratification for the developers as it feels like you were truly thinking about the player, how we are all different and might want to use a heavy hitter while playing technique, or want to be moving extremely quick on a motivity build to squeeze out the most of our Aegis and create some sort of gladiator build. Liza P has the same feeling as going to your grandmother's house and you're greeted with 70 different options on what to eat or drink. I felt very well taken care of in this department and it holds up. There are tons of different options that were fun for me and will have me going back for repeat playthroughs. Now that we've gotten the basics out the way, I think we can discuss the gameplay loop of this title, and how fights will play out for a player. The game gives you all these different options to pick and choose for your build, but is it really necessary to care about all this stuff? I'd argue yes, as it can make or break your sanity. 
When engaging with a boss, a lot of it can be boiled down to getting good at the perfect guard, but at the same time I'd argue it's just as useful to put your entire arsenal to use. For example, are you fighting a puppet or a human? Well, this will change what type of enchantment you'd apply to your weapon through a grindstone, or even what throwables you'd bring to a fight to give yourself an edge. The game offers you so many different options, not just in how you want your weapon to swing or its scaling, but also how you prepare yourself for each fight, with specific consumables to combat a boss. Do you need a certain fable art to deal with a move or for the strategy you want? While you don't have to necessarily think extremely hard about any of this, it's a nice sense of depth in how your build will perform based on the choices you make. Your knowledge from playing the game and paying attention. Sometimes, this can be the deciding factor on whether or not you can beat a certain boss that you're on, allowing for weaknesses to be taken into account, but also different fighting styles. On some fights, I noticed myself dodging more hits than parrying as this gave me better windows of opportunity to strike and dish out some good damage over just trying to perfect guard or guard everything and slowly lose my pulse cells or other resources that could have been mitigated through evaluating all my options and changing what tactics I used per boss. This also made the gameplay loop extremely rewarding for somebody like myself, as I value the preparation and the know-how on how to tackle fights. For example, Dark Souls 2, while probably disliked or not everybody's favorite, does a good job of this. Maybe you're going to fight the Pursuer, but you're not great at dodging his moveset or want to get through the fight quick. Well, you can bait him to stand in front of a Ballista and demolish his health bar in two strikes, simplifying the fight and giving you a complete advantage. This might not be something you realize your first time or first few attempts as while they are present earlier in the level and you can use them yourself in the heat of the moment, this may not register in your mind, but over time you realize, hey wait, there's a better way to do this and I always appreciate how the more you play a game and learn about it, the better a strategy you can put together. Showing that your time put in means something over always needing to be the greatest gamer you can be. I just found myself constantly testing new things and being experimental with the gameplay systems in Lies of P to work towards my advantage. Part of this is due to the game advertising the weapon combining mechanic, and through experimenting with that system, it also seeps into how you'd play the game in general. This curiosity has you now questioning, maybe if I bring this, this, and this to the fight, it'll be way easier or manageable and make my experience all the more enjoyable as I learn new things. Part of the fun of Liza P is through this learning, as I always appreciate games that have a knowledge curve showing how the player has developed aside from just pattern memorization and from using different movesets. Liza P has you going through different stages and level environments to get through the story. You'll start in a train station and go around the entire city of Krat, experiencing the different streets and sights to see while you're slaying hordes of puppets and other mobs through each area. The gameplay loop is fun, tight, and very compact as a single player action RPG experience. Going from area to area will have you usually fighting a small group of enemies, unless you try to run through the whole thing and get caught by the insane aggro range present on some of the mobs. Overall, you don't see yourself facing hordes like you would in something like Scholar of the First Sin, but I wouldn't say it's low population either. The amount of enemies feels just right for what they were going for which was a Souls-like that even a beginner could pick up and play. The game is very accessible as they throw shortcuts at you at key points in the level to make runbacks or deaths to mobs or bosses not very frustrating. For most of the boss fights in the game, they give you a stargazer, the checkpoints of this game, usually right outside the boss room or a short runaway through one or two mobs that you can usually dodge. This is a godsend as I'm used to running a lot further in other titles in the series and I don't think it's a bad thing or takes away from the challenge of the game. On the contrary, I think design like this lets the developer create an even harder challenge for the player because you don't have to waste time attempting the boss, instead you're right there and you can try as many times as you'd like. Levels also have items you can pick up and little collectibles here and there. Either a new weapon, amulets, or other little accessories or gear for you to pick up. Some are found through chests, others are obtained by defeating mini-bosses in the area or optional bosses occasionally, and this gives you reasons to explore the areas to see what you can find. For example, at the end of this tunnel of a flaming boulder, you can see a chest, and inside it I found a new weapon giving me another style of fighting to engage with. The game truly rewards you for looking about, you can find lore tidbits, new gear, maybe a quest line is somewhere out there for you and will unlock something cool like the beautiful records you can acquire. 
Going through each area, even the ones that are made to be grotesque or unappealing, are fun to roam around and see what you can find with all the little things to see. The enemy variety is great as well. There are a few different factions, if you want to call them that, to go through. There's the Corrupted, the Puppets, and the Alchemists, to name a few. There are variances and some mobs that will appear in multiple areas, but it's never out of place or has you question why this foe is here, and feels like it just adds to the game world. Aesthetically, the levels all look beautiful, and capture the designs that the city of Krat is going for very well. Roaming through the streets of a rich neighborhood, a bustling factory that was manufacturing puppets in mass, to the ruins of the slums and some other areas I won't spoil. The game does a great job of portraying the city of Krat to you and giving it character where, when approaching this game, you would know nothing about it aside from the Pinocchio cast of characters and maybe that it's steampunk from the aesthetic. Most people will compare this to Bloodborne for sure, and I do get those comparisons, they make sense, but honestly, the city itself gives me more Dishonored vibes than anything. From the mechanical contraptions all over the place, the use of Ergo compared to Whale Oil, the aesthetic reminds me heavily of Dunwall, and I love that. You learn so much about the world through the notes you can pick up off the floor in areas, or just by talking to the different NPCs around the hotel, or those out and about. There is a ton of variety in Krat, and each area feels like its own living, breathing organ all together to make the identity that is the city. Jiminy giving you little tour guide facts is always golden, as he tells you what the area was like pre-Puppet Frenzy, and gives you a good idea what that part of the city was for. Rosa Isabella Street reflects the high and mighty nature of the rich, being home to orchestral music and attractions here and there, Elysian Boulevard being the shopping district that leads to City Hall and has a circus, the Malam district being the slums, the swamps, the Grand Exhibition. Each level is a treat as you go through and discover a bit more about the city and what kind of business or daily life was going on here beforehand. Reading the notes present before bosses can also give you tidbits on the bosses themselves, along with what they were doing at this establishment. The director said in an interview that he views the hotel as another character, a living, breathing thing. And while I concur, I'd extend this to the entire city, as it doesn't feel like some lifeless set piece you're going through for no reason, or pretty face with no substance. It feels like, yeah, this is Krat. I'm here and learning about it is bliss. With learning so much about the world through the scenery, I think the story would be the next best talking point. The story in Liza P starts off with you making your way to Hotel Krat. There isn't a lot of reason to it other than the city is under siege of the puppets and it's not safe anywhere. Once we get there, we are looking for our father or creator, Geppetto. Upon finding Geppetto, you see that he's in conflict with another man over the distress of the situation, the puppet frenzy, and wondering how this came to be as Geppetto is considered the father of all puppets and the best creator. You being his best work, he refers to you as his son and constantly reminds you to be a good boy to him. From here, we're thrust into finding the cause of the puppet's malfunction along with what is really happening to the city of Krat, and if there's a cure to the phenomena occurring in the city. The story does a good job of presenting itself without being too in your face for those who just want to play the game, but also not so much on the back foot that you must go out of your way to find a YouTube explanation or outside resources to tell you what's happening. Rather, you can find out and get the gist of most things by talking to the NPCs, reading the notes or books as you find them as they give more background to the areas, doing side quests for your friends and people you meet, giving you context on just how grim the situation is for the people that inhabit Krat and to decide if you're going to try to have a good influence in their lives, or not. As we follow Pinocchio through his journey of Krat, you meet a diverse cast of characters all with different goals and ideals in the city. Some masquerading as friends only to want you for their personal gain, others lost and needing a friend's assistance through these hard times. As you engage with the main story and conversations with the NPCs, they may have side quests or favors to ask of you. This gives you an opportunity to learn more about them and the ongoings in Krat. Some with good intentions, and some just needing you to deal with something. They did a great job with fleshing out Krat's characters and the story without it feeling bloated or over-explained like some games might do. Through the story, you may even find yourself needing to make choices that will affect your ending, but also you as the player, as do you choose what's best for the people around you, or do you pick a choice that may hurt them? Ultimately, these are things that are parallel to that of the real world. 
Sometimes we'll make choices that harm one another. Other times you may lie for the sake of people around you. It's just part of being a human. There are some interesting twists and turns on your journey that I won't spoil for you here, and encourage those looking for a new world to dive into to give this one a shot. An aspect of the game that I hope is talked about is the music. I don't have too much to say on this ironically, as I'm no sound engineer or somebody with a musical background, but the tracks that play through the world are melancholic in tone. They do a good job of setting the scene for you as you go through the areas and engage with the city and the boss fights. The themes do a good job of sticking out and adding to the experience without feeling like a sore inclusion or an afterthought. The music designers over at Round 8 and NeoWiz deserve a round of applause as this soundtrack had me feeling immersed in the fights and just looking at the scenery as I walked by. Taking heavy inspiration from French culture, a lot of the vocal tracks of the game are actually in French as well. You are given many of those tracks through completing the side quests for the characters as a reward, sometimes for lying, other times for being truthful and doing what they'd like. I feel that a lot of the game's feeling can be heard through these tracks, it's just a shame that for the most part they only play on the record player back at the hotel, as they're beautiful and I've even added them to my own personal playlist. The quests themselves are structured very similar to Soulsborne quests, but in Liza P there's a nice quality of life touch to them. If a character has something to say to you, or there is an optional event to take part in, an icon of said character will show up near the fast travel points in the Stargazer, letting you know hey, there's something you can do if you want. Typically involving you talking to an NPC, going to a region or getting something for them, and following it up at the end with a decision for you to make as the player. Do you lie or tell the truth? For some of these I find the structure enjoyable, but sometimes the answer to progress the story in a certain way didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. As being human doesn't always mean being malicious or evil with a lie, but sometimes saving somebody from pain. Other times maybe you tell the truth as there's nothing wrong with that, but in some instances telling the truth felt like the wrong option which I found puzzling. I understand lying is in the name, but sometimes the choices didn't feel right to me. I feel like there could have been a bit more to the side quests as, for example, in Bloodborne, some of the quest lines will lead to unique fights or situations, but there wasn't really anything like that in Liza P. They didn't overstay their welcome or feel like a chore to do either though, and I appreciate that as it was fun learning about the cast of characters. How does Lies of P stack up against contemporaries or peers? In my opinion, this is definitely in the upper echelon of Souls games in general. Yes, including the original titles and From Software spin-offs. If you told me Lies of P was your favorite or had something that would put it above all the other titles, I really couldn't blame you because this game has a lot of charm to it. Taking the familiar story of Pinocchio, the boy who lies, and putting the spin on it of throwing you into a dangerous apocalyptic setting where what you do and your choices define what a puppet, or rather what being Pinocchio really means to you as the player. You find yourself seeing faces you'd know from the story or movie, but with a unique twist on it giving this world familiarity, but at the same time, the allure of a new unknown in Krat. A setting you know nothing about and you're experiencing a lot of your firsts alongside Pinocchio and Jiminy. It's a wonderful adventure with great voice acting, tight gameplay, and amazing interconnected levels. If you're looking for more of this gameplay, aside from the stuff From Software has put out, I'd argue Lies of P is up there with them and Steam Ninja's releases. I can't wait to see what the studio puts out next, whether it's DLC for Lies of P or a sequel of some sort, as they have good ideas under their belt and I'd say that the design decisions they have made paid off. I'm not sure what the overall consensus is on the difficulty for Lies of P online. As I'm sure some people will argue this is the easiest Souls-like, and I feel like others could say the hardest. For me personally, I definitely put it up there in terms of difficulty. Some boss fights vary and aren't too tough, but later on the moves that are thrown your way can mix you up hard. They can be fast, matching the rhythm of the tracks, and then slow to throw you off your pacing. They do a good job of making it so you're never too comfortable while playing and always attentive to what's happening. This is for sure a challenging game, but the developers took that into account and made it also an experience that's very accessible to newcomers to these types of games. Not only do you have plenty of weapons to sift through and come up with a combination or playstyle that matches something for your situation, you also have access to summons. Now, in my playthrough I used summons twice for the two gank fights, as I personally am not a big fan of those. They're not impossibly difficult without the summons as I was able to get the bosses down to about a quarter before choking the fight. I just didn't feel like hacking against it till I was done, so I used the summon to get through it and it felt like it was definitely a game changer. 
Having the heat taken off you with a summon can make some of the fights feel a bit trivial, so I wouldn't say there's a good balance when using the summon. I believe this was added instead of adding an arbitrary easy mode, but it serves a similar purpose, and does so well enough that you should never feel overwhelmed or as if you can't beat a specific boss fight. They also made the material needed to summon an NPC for help readily available so you won't feel like you're wasting it upon use. The game definitely has a brutal challenge for those looking for it, but if you've always wanted to play a Souls-like, and maybe the difficulty was too daunting or just frustrated you too much, I implore you, be patient when learning the game and the mechanics it wants you to use, and use the summons as well as this will drastically alter the experience in your favor. The game wants you to use everything you've learned for encounters. You can most definitely get by just using what you'd like, but if you take advantage of the consumables, weapon enchants, legion system, and P organs, you can turn Pinocchio into a menacing death puppet that will be able to deal with anything the game has to throw at you. Speaking shortly on the optimization, I'd like to say this game is running incredibly well on my machine at high graphics with 3080 Ti and a Ryzen 5600X for the processor. All while recording for 1080p 60fps, I was playing with DLSS enabled, so if you plan on playing it with it off, I'm not sure how it'll fare, if much worse or better, with similar hardware, but I have no complaints in terms of performance. There was the occasional odd frame drop when there was a good amount of particle effects at once, such as the boss doing a super attack, and I'm also in a fable art animation, while everything is just moving really fast. But outside of a freak scenario like that, it was very consistent. In terms of bugs, I only encountered one in my playthrough that honestly worked out in my favor. The final boss completely yeeted himself up when I encountered with the Aegis, despawning him and giving me a free victory. But hey, I'll take it. Bro went meow. Lies of P stands amongst some of the greats this year and some of the great souls likes of all time. Timothy Chalamet and the rest of the characters alongside the development team did an amazing job bringing this world to life and made their own mark on the gaming landscape. This game took what we all know and love as Souls fans, but made it to their own, and I have nothing but respect for innovating on an existing idea successfully, so players can have more fun experiences to look forward to in 2023 and beyond. If you're interested in Liza P and don't know, it's on Game Pass currently, so if you're unsure about forking over the 60 for it, it's always there to try, and I hope you enjoy it if you do. What did you think of Liza P? Did it meet your expectations? Was there more you wanted explored? Will you play the next installment in the series? I'm truly excited to see what the team has next in store. It seems like it was teased at the end of the game, but until then, I'll see you in Krat, folks. Or wonder where you've been. But Thank you so much to everybody who took time out of their day to watch this video and has supported my last two projects. Honestly, I feel like the channel grew more than I was expecting with only two videos out, and I have nothing but appreciation for anybody that's watched, commented, liked, or subbed. It all helps out as I went from 11 subs on the Armored Core video to 20-ish the day after the Starfield video came out, and almost 130 a week or so after that. It's still blowing my mind to see metrics like this, and the Starfield video did astonishingly well compared to my expectations. Thank you again for watching, and take care of yourselves out there.